Capitalism and Disability by Marta Russell. This is chapter nine, Disablement, Prison, and Historical Segregation. The story of disablement in the prison industrial complex must begin with a trail of telling numbers. A disproportionate number of persons incarcerated in US prisons and jails are disabled. Though Census Bureau data suggests that disabled persons represent roughly one-fifth of the total population, prevalence of disability among prisoners is starting startlingly higher for reasons we will examine later. While no reliable cross-disability demographics have been compiled nationwide, numerous studies now enable us to make educated estimates regarding the incidence of various disability categories among incarcerated persons. Hearing loss, for example, is estimated to occur in 30% of the prison population, while estimates of the prevalence of intellectual disability among prisoners range from 3 to 9.5%. Rates of learning disability are spectacularly high among prisoners. In studies conducted among incarcerated juveniles, learning disabilities have been estimated to occur in up to 55% of youth nationwide. In one single state study, 70% of youth qualified for special education. As for mental disabilities in California, anywhere from one sixth to one fourth of prisoners are believed to have diagnosable serious mental disorders. Most stunning of all is a four state study that examined juveniles imprisoned for capital offenses. Virtually 100% of those studied were, multi were multiply disabled neurological impairment, psychiatric illness, cognitive deficits, having suffered serious central nervous system injuries resulting from extreme physical and sexual abuse since early childhood. Why are so many prisoners in the United States disabled? Genetic determinists like to attribute the high prevalence of, dis of disability among prisoners to inherited deficiencies. For instance, James Watson of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory holds that we perhaps most realistically should see a person's handicap as the major origin of a social behavior that has among its many bad consequences the breeding of criminal violence. In opposition to this view, we propose the alternative approach forged by Marx, a material analysis of the economic and social forces of capitalism. The structure of capitalist America plays a central role in the life of any group, including that of people with disabilities. Given the historic segregation of disabled persons, not only from American society, but from the accumulation process, disabled people living in the so-called free world have a grim commonality with their disabled compatriots behind bars. Institutions in general, including prisons, have functioned to support the accumulation of capital and the social control of surplus population, including the reserve army of unemployed left adrift by an economic system which dictates that large numbers of workers must be unemployed. The prison population is not a cross-section of America. Prisoners are poorer and considerably less likely to be employed than the rest of the population, and poverty in America is inevitably linked to a higher prevalence of disability. Neither quality health care, nor safe, adequate housing, nor nutritious food has been available to poor people. Environmental racism, the, the siting of toxic waste dumps, and other poison-emitting industries in low-income, mostly non-white neighborhoods, has a devastating impact. Not only are poor children exposed to lead and other toxins, resulting in high rates of, de of developmental and learning disabilities. They also drink poisoned water and breathe poisoned air, leading to extreme prevalence of asthma and other respiratory illnesses and cancers. Poor people often live in neighborhoods plagued by drug and alcohol abuse, leading to physical and psychological damage, including fetal alcohol syndrome and marked by violent crime leading to spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and other disabilities. 
As Christian Parenti explains in Lockdown America, capitalism, the creator of poverty, simultaneously needs and is threatened by the poor. In order to manage and contain its surplus populations in poorest classes, American capitalism has developed paramilitary forms of segregation, containment, and repression. Not coincidentally, it has created the social condition we are calling disablement by excluding disabled persons from full participation in society through segregation, containment, and repression. It is this theory of disablement which we intend to explore here. Historical segregation and social control. Let us not be lulled into thinking that disabled persons living outside of prisons have autonomous lives. Institutional life, whether in a prison, hospital, mental institution, nursing home, or segregated school, and many receive no schooling, has been the forced historical reality, not the exception for disabled persons. Unlike race or gender, disablement is not generally thought of as, an out as the outcome of capitalist social power relations. Rather, it tends to be viewed as a matter for medicine to cure or control. Our medical and social welfare institutions have historically held disablement to be an individual problem, a personal tragedy. They blame a disabled person's inability to participate fully in the economic life of our society on their physiological, anatomical, or mental limitations, rather, th rather than on economic or social forces. Disability activists and theorists, however, have laid a materialist groundwork for understanding disability oppression. If we trace how work evolved under capitalism, we can observe its effects on the disabled population. While one cannot claim that working age disabled persons in pre-capitalist societies had achieved full integration and economic well-being, many occupied a niche in small workshops and family-based production, where they could contribute according to their ability. Early capitalism required a major shift in both the social organization of work and the concept of human labor, as human beings were gathered into the dark satanic mills to accomplish the sacred task of capital accumulation, circumstances arose which became barriers to disabled people's survival. Disabled workers were increasingly excluded from paid employment on the grounds that they were unable to keep pace with the new mechanized factory-based production system. Industrial capitalism commodified the human body, creating both a class of proletarians and a class of disabled. Over time, it became justifiable to remove individuals with impairments from mainstream life and segregate them in a variety of institutions, including workhouses, asylums, prisons, colonies, and special schools. At the same time as it is marginalized and segregated disabled people and institutions, industrial capitalism and its grinding push toward productivity at any cost has caused disabling accidents and conditions to occur at an unprecedented rate. Viewed in this light, black lung, brown lung, asbestos, and a host of other deadly illnesses are the direct offspring of capitalism, along with a chilling litany of incidents in which factory workers have been paralyzed, burned, blinded, deafened, lost limbs, lost physical or mental function, or have otherwise been rendered disabled. Today, repetitive strain injury debilitates hundreds of thousands of mostly high-tech workers, accounting for 66% of all reported work-related illnesses in 1999. While capitalism shunted disabled persons out of the worker pool and into institutions, the medical industry pathologized traits such as blindness, deafness, and physical and mental impairments that have naturally appeared in the human race throughout history. In the Foucauldian sense, medicalized and institutionalization, or medicalization and inst institutionalization, became means of social control, relegating disabled persons to isolation and exclusion from society. The combination met capitalism's need for discipline and control. Michael Oliver explains, the institution is repressive in that all those who either cannot or will not conform to the norms and discipline of capitalist society can be removed from it. 
It is ideological in that it stands as a visible monument for all those who, are cur who currently conform but may not continue to do so. If you do not behave, the institution awaits you. Institutions of all descriptions thus became formidable, formalized containment devices. It is now the disability rights movement's primary, primary revolutionary goal to reverse this trend. The impact on disabled people of this kind of segregation has been profound. They are the least likely to be employed, the most likely to be impoverished and undereducated. Disabled persons are twice as likely not to finish high school. 22% versus 9%. A disproportionate number of disabled persons A disproportionate number of disabled pe persons I lost my spot. <laughs> Um, report having inadequate access to health care, 28% versus 12%, or transportation, 30% versus 10%. Of course, mu one must acknowledge that disabled people live on the, on the economic margins of all societies throughout the world, not merely in capitalist countries. But nowhere else are we witness to the jarring disconnect between a society's vast wealth and its refusal to provide more than the barest means of survival for its most vulnerable citizens. Sentenced to hard labor. Social control does not tell the complete story of disabled people's segregation and ensuing institutionalization. By placing the focus on cure and by segregating incurables into the administrative category of disabled, the medical industry bolstered capitalist business interests and shoved less exploitable workers with impairments or those who obstructed capital accumulation out of the workforce. At the same time that US capitalists closed their doors to disabled workers, their drive to maximize profits in today's global economy leads them to abandon even their non-disabled employees, relo relocating factories overseas where wages are as little as 20 cents per hour, child labor is legal, and workers are not provided benefits or health care. They have also rediscovered that they do not have to go so far afield. If relocation of factories to developing countries has produced lavish profits for the capitalist class, little can compare to the windfall generated in recent years by an even more lucrative worker pool. Prison labor. Not only are prisons posited as a primary solution to the country's social problems, but prisons are among the fastest growing industries in the United States. Workers earn as little as 22 cents per hour and companies avoid the added costs of shipping and infrastructure enhancement required when they operate in poorer countries. Not coincidentally, occupational safety and health administration laws do not apply to the prison industry, with the result that materials used in prison manufacturing are often toxic and dangerous when handled without adequate protection. For example, urethane foam used, used in furniture production by California's prison industry authority at Tehachapi, Tehachapi, Chap, Tehachap, oh, I'm, I can't pronounce this. Tehachapi prison is cut to size in unventilated shops posing a potentially lethal health threat to prisoners. When the foam is cut with power saws, tiny particles are dispersed into the air. Trapped inside human lungs, these particles are carcinogenic, causing a condition similar to asbe asbestos. Urethane foam also produces a lethal gas if accidentally ignited. In a grotesque sidebar to this story, state agencies, schools, hospitals, and libraries are forced under California law to buy these prison-made chairs and couches, despite the foam's clearly printed warning. Though the California Furniture Association does not approve the use of this foam in furniture, the prison industry authority ignores the danger. What we have is a billion dollar manufacturing industry that legally utilizes slave labor, has little overhead, is unregulated by state and federal workplace safety or labor laws, 
provides no health insurance or benefits and no sick pay for its employees, includes hazardous materials in the construction of its products, forces customers to buy those products under penalty of law, and prohibits its workers from organizing. There's not been a larger pool of free labor since the end of the Civil War. The neoliberal shift, the institutionalization and incarceration. To better understand the relationship between disability and prison, it is instructive to focus on the treatment of those who are mentally ill. In the second half of the 20th century, the dominance of the mental health institution began to decline as the capitalist economy underwent restructuring. Economic stagnation, low profits, and the fiscal crisis of the 70s were met with regonomics, i.e. tax cuts for corporations and the wealthy, an attack on labor, deregulation of health and safety regulations, and cuts in state spending on education, welfare, and social programs, including those institutions housing people with mental illnesses. Deinstitutionalization, as it related to those who had been labeled mentally ill, was a government policy change driven by cost-cutting motives. Spending by the 50 states on treatment for people with mental illness, for instance, was lower by a third in the 90s than it was in the 50s. Fewer than half of Americans diagnosed with schizophrenia receive adequate services today. When the awful snake pits of neglect and abuse we call mental institutions were closed, necessary new structures and solutions, including community housing, employment services, a vital component for populations experiencing severe labor market discrimination, and other appropriate programs designed and run by disabled individuals themselves were never put in place. Instead, GOP revolutionaries of the 104th Congress falsely blaming the deficit on the welfare state and entitlements, attacked the social safety net. The 1990s crackdown on federal disability and welfare benefits and state reductions to general relief and Medicaid further expanded the scope of damage to deinstitutionalized people who had been diagnosed with mental illness, many of whom found themselves, found themselves destitute the moment they were discharged from the hospitals. Because the states had abandoned their social contract with deinstitutionalized people labeled mentally ill, many were left stranded on the streets, caught up in the revolving door between homelessness and prison. At present, an overwhelming number of jail inmates with mental illness are homeless. For instance, of the approximately 2,850 mentally ill people in New York City, jails on any given day in 1996, 43% were homeless. The vast majority were not violent or dangerous. They have been jailed for petty theft, disturbing the peace, and other crimes directly related to their illness. Increasingly, the, ju the judicial system <clears throat> punishes such people for their quality of life misdemeanors by slapping them with jail sentences. <coughs> 670,000 of them in 1996. <coughs> At any given moment, 40% of all Americans with serious mental illness <coughs> are estimated to be in jail or prison, comprising from 10 to 30% of all inmates. The Center on Crime, Communities, and Culture concludes that in many jurisdictions, jails have become the primary treatment provider for poor people with mental illnesses. This criminalization of mental illness has its root in the U.S. capitalist healthcare system and the growth of the prison industry. The great majority of mentally ill people in New York jails and prisons, for instance, are Medicaid recipients or have no insurance at all. To qualify for Medicaid, low-income individuals must be extremely debilitated and in indigent, <coughs> which many achieve by spending down savings, and they must stay in indigent. <clears throat> Adding insult to injury, mental health parity does not exist in the private U.S. insurance system. For instance, private long-term disability plans, most, most of them employer-sponsored, provide benefits to eligible recipients with physical disorders through age 65, 
while they imposed duration limits of 24 months or less on benefits to eligible recipients with mental disorders. In defending his, its refusal to provide mental health parity, the insurance industry claims the extra coverage would place a demand on the for-profit system, which would cause everyone's premiums to skyrocket. In order to protect its profit margin, the corporate health care industry denies this segment of the population treatment and services. The rise of managed care, now the dominant paradigm among hospitals and physicians, has also had a debilitating effect in the name of cost containment. Payment mechanisms have shifted. Hospitals and doctors are now paid a flat fee instead of receiving payment for individual services rendered. Because of financial incentives for physicians and hospitals to keep costs low, people who have been hospitalized for mental illness are often discharged in three weeks, ready or not, without a discharge plan that would provide them with crucial community support. People with so-called mental illnesses are generally deemed to have little or no production value. Their unemployment rate is the highest among the disabled population at 80% and disproportionately high within the incarcerated population. Perhaps the term social junk as coined by criminologist Steven Spitzer best describes how society views this cast off segment of the population. People labeled mentally ill experience harsh discrimination in many arenas, among them housing, employment, and health insurance. Increasingly, they have become a part of what Christian Christian Parenti calls a growing stratum of surplus people who, because they are not being efficiently used by the economy, must instead be controlled and contained and, in a very limited way, rendered economically useful as raw material for a growing corrections complex. Thus, the old snake pit mental institution is being replaced with yet another institution, the prison, where incarcerated social wreckage contributes to the GDP by supporting thousands of persons associated with expanding and maintaining the prison industry. Mental health advocacy groups rightly point out that people with mental illness rarely belong in prison. Jail diversion and discharge planning, they say, are key to stopping the revolving door of repeated hospitalizations and incarcerations. They recommend ongoing community treatment and support services, all grossly underfunded now to mend the broken system. The psychiatric social change movement comprised of survival, survivors of the mental health industry is wary of solutions that may lead to forced hospitalization, involuntary psychiatric drugging. Psychiatric medicine is not a science and damage is often done by inappropriate drugs and forced electroshock, all of which have been a part of the corporate psychiatric model. The World Bank now has a mental health division to promote corporate psychi psychiatry globally. In 37 states, people living in their own homes can be court ordered to take psychiatric drugs, even though many experience toxic reactions to such, to such treatment. Six states have at-home drug deliveries. The shattered mental health system has largely depended upon one or another form of incarceration and forced treatment whether in hospitals or prisons. In their efforts to end the involuntary imprisonment of so-called mentally ill persons, grassroots social change groups are concerned that one destructive institution not be replaced with another. The focus must be on human rights, including the right to refuse treatment, empowerment, and alternatives such as community and peer support. Oppression behind bars. We have shown that American capitalism in its failure to incorporate disabled people into its social fabric instead shunts them into prisons and other institutions. Not surprisingly, once behind bars, prisoners with disabilities face even greater abuse and discrimination than they had encountered on the outside. For example, throughout the United States, guards are known to confiscate from inmates with disabilities whatever will be most acutely missed wheelchairs, walkers, crutches, braces, hearing aids, glasses, catheters, egg crates, special mattresses designed to prevent skin breakdown and, and AIDS circulation, and medications. Prisoners who require personal care or assistance, for example, 
uh, for example, quadriplegic inmates who need help with eating, dressing, bathing, etc., are simply ignored. They go without meals and are forced to urinate on themselves in the absence of bathroom assistance. Because of, ar because of architectural barriers, physically disabled inmates are unable to access dining halls, libraries, work, and recreational areas and visiting rooms, not to mention the toilet, toilets, sinks, and beds in their own cells. Blind prisoners are unable to read their own mail or research their cases. In the prison law library, because they are not provided with readers or taped brailled materials. Deaf prisoners are denied interpreters, making it impossible for them to participate in work programs, counseling, alcohol, and substance abuse programs, medical appointments, and their own parole and disciplinary hearings. Disabled prisoners are routinely denied enrollment in work furlough programs sometimes significantly lengthening their periods of incarceration. All of the above are violations of the American with Disabilities Act, which under the Supreme Court's 1998 ruling in Yeski, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Corrections et al. versus Ronald R. Yetz Yeski, applies to state prisons. In addition, psychological abuse of disabled prisoners by guards for example, the moving around of furniture in the cell of a blind prisoner or verbal taunts over a loudspeaker have been documented in, documented in prison after prison throughout the country. Also, also rampant is medical abuse. Across the United States, prisoners with treatable disabling conditions die as a result of medical neglect. Both psychological and medical abuse are clear violations not only of the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, injunction against cruel and unusual punishment, but of various international human rights statutes. Fuck. Go away, Obi. Go. It is ironic that the institution which most dramatically exemplifies American society's failure to humanize disability not only cranks out furniture and license plates, but manufactures disability as well. The harshness of prison life disables people. Inadequate or absent medical care, poor nutrition, violence, and extremes of heat, cold, and noise inside prison, not to mention the lack of sensory, emotional, intellectual, and physical stimuli, all lead directly to acute or chronic physical and psychological disabilities. Prison overcrowding accelerates the disabling process. Humans who are packed into spaces designed for one-third the numbers of people actually residing in them are bound to find themselves in more frequent and more disabling violent confrontations. Guards working in such environments resort to violence more readily. Overcrowded prisons provide an even poorer standard of physical and mental health care. It almost universally produced depression, sometimes acute, as well as a panoply of other immobilizing psychological disorders. Additionally, they provide a ripe environment for the flourishing of gangs and gang violence, resulting in permanent injuries. Disability is also a byproduct of the correctional system's obsessive infatuation with security and control. Isolation units, sensory deprivation cells, and other instruments of torture, such as cattle prods and stun guns, generate mental breakdowns and exacerbate pre-existing illness. The prison labor industry, as has been mentioned earlier, is entirely unregulated by workplace safety and health standards, resulting in dangerous work environments. AIDS and hepatitis C epidemics, unchecked by even the most basic humane medical intervention, have wrought havoc on the prison population. Finally, as we lock up prisoners for longer and longer periods due to mandatory minimum sentencing laws, the prison population is aging. With age comes disability. Stopping the Capitalist Juggernaut In 21st century America, the prison industrial complex is a multi-billion dollar capitalist juggernaut, devouring everything in its path. The United States spends far more on corrections than it, than it spends on higher education, locking up more than 700 people per 100,000 while most enlightened countries incarcerate fewer than 100 citizens per 100,000. 
In some American inner cities, the rate of incarceration is 2,500 to 3,000 per 100,000 uh, per 100,000. In 1995, the prison population topped 1 million. Since then, it has grown at a rate of 8.5% a year. Syndicated columnist Anthony Lewis commenting on proposed legislation that would give the states $10.5 billion to build more prisons observed. Once the states have made the investments in such prisons, there will be an inevitable urge to fill them. Sentences will tend to get longer. U.S. District Judge Wilkie Ferguson Jr. continues this line of thought. Corrections facilities are being contracted to private co uh, corporations for both construction and operation. The private companies are required to operate the prisons at 7% below government cost estimates. These firms encourage purchase of their stock by projecting growth in earnings to be paid mostly from tax dollars. Their rosy projections assume increased incarcerations. Companies that do business with prisons also foresee growth. So there's already a powerful profit incentive in keeping prisons at maximum occupancy. With such economic forces as these at work, we should not be surprised that prisons are overcrowded, that mandatory minimum sentences are enjoying unprecedented judicial popularity, and that disabled inmates are dying of abuse and neglect while their complaints fail to register even a blip on the capitalist's Richter scale. Clearly a well-coordinated activist, collective, and social change-oriented response is required. Those who are concerned about disability rights, civil rights, prisoners' rights, and human rights must join together and mobilize to put pressure on the prison system. Concomitantly, we must call for a drastic social and economic restructuring of the organization of work. We must create a social order based on equality, an order that does not punish those who cannot work, that does not make work the defining measure of our worth, and that offers counter values to the prevailing productionism which only oppresses us all.